Uh, my name is Jack Barron. I'm Managing Director here at Venture for Climate Tech. And we've got a great session today. We're going to be spending some time talking about the program and startups, entrepreneurship and climate tech specifically. We've been at it for quite a number of years, and uh, we're going to share our experiences, some of the experiences of folks who've actually come through the program, their success. We've had a lot of success, and we'll actually walk you through that. And uh, in case you're interested in getting involved, we'll actually help you with that as well over the course of uh, the next hour. Um, again, my name is Jack Barron. I'm Managing Director here at Venture for Climate Tech. I am a serial entrepreneur. I had one um, company that I started with two colleagues back in 1997. We grew that to from zero to a little over $2 billion in revenues. We sold it and exited. That was a public company. We took it public in the process. $2.3 billion we sold it for. Um, went into climate tech immediately after that, which was 2009. Uh, permanently. I had been in climate tech um, kind of indirectly from 2006 to 2009, but then got into biofuels, biomaterials, um, and microcrystalline cellulose, nanofibrillated cellulose, so some fairly deep tech in the climate realm. Um, a little bit about venture for climate tech. So we are a nonprofit accelerator. So we help early stage companies to secure a brighter, more sustainable future. We support a diverse set of founders, with, through a coalition of investors, mentors, and technical experts that are committed to really catalyzing new climate tech solutions. And we're very focused on climate tech across the, the, the space. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. It's a six month virtual program. It is intensive, um, intensive mentorship, and we have a large mentor network. Each year we choose um, 20 pre-seed and seed stage startups, innovators from around the world uh, per cohort. And we have up to $50,000 in non-dilutive funding per company that we bring into the program. So that's not total. It's on a per company basis. Um, and typically at the beginning of the program, of course, companies are always focused and their founders are always focused on non-dilutive funding. But we survey them throughout the program and in, in the post survey at the end of the program, the 50,000 or 50,000 plus is great. They're really happy with the money. That's not what they ever cite as being the most valuable thing from the program. It's really the mentorship and the network access to uh, the help in terms of preparing the company for the marketplace, preparing for commercialization, next steps, the investor network and the preparation in terms of how to get out there and get the company funded. So we are funded by NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research Development Authority. They are fabulous and they have done uh, a tremendous uh, number of accelerators over the years. We are their early stage climate accelerator um, and they are funding the entire program. So if you don't know much about NYSERDA, go online and take a look. Uh, we are part of NextCore, which is based here in Rochester, New York. It is a multi-accelerator program, a not-for-profit as well. Helps early stage companies really kind of across the spectrum. We're the climate early stage climate focus. And our partners are an organization called Second Muse, who are tremendous and global um, in nature and really focus on some of our global competitions as well as helping us with sponsorship and the investment network. So a little bit about the history of the program. It's been pretty extraordinary. There was a, a predecessor program called Nexus New York, which uh, um, you'll hear a little bit from Devin Sandin, who was uh, as part of our group now and was part of that team as well for a number of years. But this program, Venture for Climate Tech, has been in existence a little over three years. We've now completed three cohorts or three groups uh, of founders, um, 43 startups total. During the program, the teams have doubled in size. So we've literally had um, a double in full-time equivalents or personnel at these organizations. From a funding perspective, um, out of the first 22 um, companies that came through the program, so the first two cohorts, six went on to funding through uh, further funding from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, so Bill Gates' organization. Uh, a number went on for SBIR, so federal support. Um, some went on to the DOE, ARPA-E, you may know, be familiar with them. And But many, many have actually received additional dilutive funding. So non-dilutive funding, those founders have raised a total of $31 million since. And remember, these are pre-seed and seed stage. These are early, early stage companies uh, just over the last three years. $62 million in follow-on funding. So a remarkable amount of funding. 
uh, has come in. Um, and kind of one of the more remarkable things about that is in this last year, you may have heard that it's very challenging to actually raise capital in the early stage space. Uh, it has been tough, but our founders have found a way to do it. And uh, part of that is the investor network we help them with. So we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, Act we see Activate and uh, Department of Energy on there and the National Science Foundation, NSF, who are also have funded some of our early stage companies. Moving right along, we're going to talk a little bit about the team. Um, as I said, I'm Jack Barron. We recently hired uh, Jenny Leung, who came to us from Techstars LA. Uh, she joined us part-time in last August and full-time this January. She is at the director level. She is remarkable and bringing a lot of new concepts and energy to our team. Devin Sandin, who I mentioned earlier, has been with our program since its inception and actually before that with the Nexus New York program. Scott Myers, a deep background in program and curriculum. He's been with us for a few years now. Chris Carpenter, several years. Uh, one point about Devin, Scott, and Chris, they all have pretty deep policy backgrounds as well. Uh, they've worked for government leaders all the way up to the majority leader of the Senate in Devin's case. Um, so these folks have uh, just outrageously good backgrounds and a very serious climate focus. Sharon Samjit Singh, uh, serial entrepreneur herself, brilliant um, technical uh, manufacturing background and scaling manufacturing. She's uh, currently helping us on a part-time basis and leads another company that's a tech spin-out from the University of Rochester. Daniel Priager, uh, who's been described by some folks in our cohort literally as a hero in helping early stage climate companies get funded. He has just uh, an unmatched um, wealth of um, contacts in early stage funding climate folks in the U.S. and beyond. In the U.S., he's got over a thousand venture capital firms that he has relationships with, which is, again, that's unheard of. Uh, we have this strong relationship that I mentioned with Second Muse. They are our partners in this program. Shai Fogelson, who's currently the interim director in uh, climate tech for, at Second Muse, and Cassie Schutrump, who's really part of our team. Um, and she is um, running both our Global Showcase and the Global Innovation Challenge, um, as well as a, a good deal more than that. But Cassie's quite helpful, and the Second Muse team has been very supportive. Our board of directors, our board of advisors, excuse me, there are no fiduciary responsibility, but they are extraordinary. We've been blessed. And my predecessor, uh, Jacqueline Rosa Mable, she uh, built the original board here um, and just did an extraordinary job. She came from Techstars as well. Seth Levine, partner and co-founder at Foundry Group, Amy Francetic uh, at Buoyant Ventures, Rasha Hassanin. These folks have been with us now for almost four years. Um, Chief Product and Sustainability Officer at Aspen, Lou Schick, um, Director of Investments at Clean Energy Ventures, Ramsey Siegel, who uh, chaired one of our webinars just a couple of weeks ago, partner at Earthshot Ventures, Zach Neese, um, ma Managing Director at Techstars uh, Boulder years ago and founder at Grow and Lean. Kula Kesh Mukajeri, um, co-founder and managing partner at Imperative Ventures. Uh, Brandy Colander, who's exiting the board, chair of the board of uh, directors at the DC Green Bank and chief sustainability officer at Inviva. And Alex uh, Castro Perez, who's head of new business development at Ikea. So a, a very illustrious board. Uh, we're honored to have them and humbled by their presence and their help. And they help us actually in combination of networking, mentoring, and really evaluation of the companies that get into the program and at various stages throughout the program, market opportunity readiness, and even at the end of the program, the end of our formal program, I should say, uh, getting ready for investor readiness and investor presentations. The, the reason I say at the end of our formal program is because we have a number of folks in our first two cohorts who we still work with today. And we kind of never leave the program, at least uh, while we're still in existence. Um, that is um, that is kind of our legacy. Our legacy is a commitment that we're in this for the right reasons. We're in this to move the needle from a climate change standpoint and help these founders get to the next level. And that sometimes takes a number of years. So we're in for the long haul. Key sectors for New York State, these are the focus areas for NYSERDA, who, I, as I mentioned earlier, are our funders. 
Um, I remember it in an easy way, sort of uh, big T is the acronym I use in my head to remember the four areas of concentration, but buildings in the built environment are really uh, the first area we focus on that's responsible for roughly 32% of New York state emissions. One of the questions we hear a lot, by the way, is, is this open only to companies that are based in New York state? And the answer is no, it's a global program. We bring in global companies that can potentially have an impact in these four areas, an impact in New York state. So uh, buildings and built environments, so that would be building management systems, energy efficiency, in transportation, um, that's kind of obvious in some ways, but it's EV charging, it's EV support, I'll say, micromobility, energy storage, fuel cells, um, vehicles, truly, um, and all forms of transportation. Uh, the grid, uh, which is a huge focus of uh, NYSERDA, of course. So storage is a transmission asset, smart energy management. Uh, and then we get into industry, which attempting to decarbonize industry can be very challenging. So green hydrogen construction, waste management, supply chain management, heat energy recovery. We're in the midst, the early stages of beginning to evaluate folks from our fourth cohort. Applications are now open still for just a little while. Um, but we have some companies in the heat energy and recovery space that are actually uh, currently applying in this cohort. By the way, as we're going through this, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, it's better than the chat. My team will actually be evaluating these and kind of will answer them by the end. And part of my team will actually come onto the call uh, toward the end of the call and we'll answer any and all questions that you've got. So please put them in the Q&A. It's right next to the chat button uh, on your screen. Some program highlights. Uh, we recruit high impact founders and innovators from, again, from around the world. Um, it's a six month virtual, but a high touch accelerator, meaning it's intensive, it is involved, it takes between eight and 15 hours per week. So it's a commitment from the founders. We provide up to $50,000 in non dilutive funding, really by the end of the program, some of it starts at the beginning, and there's a mid stage as well. And that's on a per company basis. So it's a substantial amount of non dilutive funding. Again, we recruit globally with a New York State lens. It's a New York State lens for primarily for impact, but we would love to help companies, and we have helped quite a number of companies find a way to either move their headquarters to New York State, build a sales office in New York State, do business with customers in New York State, start their manufacturing processes or expand their manufacturing process in New York State. So I live in New York. My team mostly lives in New York, but we are always trying to highlight um, the New York State aspect of it because we are funded by NYSERDA, which is funded by the rate payers, all the electricity rate payers in New York State. Uh, angel or pre-seed stage companies are ideal. We actually have had some come from a from concept, so actually from a paper out of a university and help them get the company launched. Um, and most of them come significantly further along than that, uh, but not really early pre-seed, Pre-seed and seed stage are kind of ideal for us. So you typically come with a strong technical concept. That's typically what we see. Um, a product commercialization plan that's usually at least reasonably well thought out. Um, and a lot of companies do come to us with some early stage grant funding already in place. Uh, you don't have to be incorporated um, in order to actually apply for the program. And yet co-founder is not required. Again, as long as the tech is sound, and the plan is sound, um, you know, we can begin to help. Again, it's a part-time commitment. It's a minimum of really five to 10 hours per week. It depends and it, it varies a little bit by week, as you'd imagine. There are curriculum sessions, formal curriculum sessions. There is formal mentoring. We are tied in with um, Columbia University's Entrepreneurship in Residence program and NYSERDA helps us uh, with mentors as well. And we have our own mentor network that um, Scott, um, who I mentioned earlier, Scott Myers and Jenny Leung really have been tremendous in growing. So phase one, how does the program really work? What do you do during the program? Well, 20, if by mid-May, 20 companies will have been awarded each $5,000 in non-dilutive grants uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling. The curriculum begins, it'll be customer discovery, go to market plans, uh, greenhouse gas impact analysis. We help with that. Devin Sandin is a wizard at it. We have multiple tools. Um, we help with IP strategy, really 
even getting product to pilot or prototype or and or pilot and demonstration stage. We do a mentor matching process early. I mentioned uh, Columbia University's entrepreneurship and residence program. It's invaluable. Uh, and then we help with preparing market opportunity pitches to advance. And we actually make introductions to board I showed earlier, as well as uh, VCs who actually help on the market opportunity side. And NYSERDA is involved in that too. Plus our team, of course, that has, as you could tell earlier, pretty deep experience. Phase two happens in early August after the market opportunity pitches, which really happen at the end of July, or I guess on August 1 this year. Up to 10 teams will be awarded $25,000 in non-dilutive grants each. Um, continued curriculum, including fundraising uh, and sales. So we focus a lot at that point. We start to typically focus on fundraising or customer discovery if it hasn't been really completed by that point in time. There's always some evolution in terms of the technology. So we assist in that where we can. All 20 teams uh, receive a $2,500 travel stipend for what we call our demo day or our showcase that I mentioned that Second Muse is uh, primarily responsible for, and we help them with that in New York City during Climate Week. That's mid to late September. Um, and this year, I think it's on the 22nd, but maybe in the chat, one of my uh, colleagues will actually correct me. And uh, moving along. Days three, late September. So investor matching opens up. Uh, that's part of the investor showcase as well. Second Muse is already working on that uh, in conjunction and collaboration with us. We will have investors present and involved in the investor showcase and investor matching at the showcase. Uh, um, Post-graduation support, I mentioned earlier, it really does continue uh, long-term. And that's continued investment and fundraising help, but continued mentoring, um, really any and all challenges that early stage companies are facing. We do our best to either connect those the co-founders with the right people or help resolve them ourselves or give them our best advice. So each week, what does a week look like during the program? We have a stand-up meeting, as we call it, um, which is really all hands uh, with the core cohort. This past year with 20 companies, we ran it as a one fairly large group of 20 companies plus uh, some of our mentors and team. Um, we're separating that out this year because we want the cohort to be a little bit more cohesive. Uh, so it'll be 10 companies in each sub cohort, if you will. Uh, it'll still be a cohort of 20, but we'll have a, two sub cohorts of 10. Uh, there are one to two curriculum sessions, uh, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the program. A one-to-one -one coaching session, that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's really a team from my team of experienced entrepreneurs, including myself or Jenny Lee Young, Sharon Samjit Singh, Danny Friagere, who I mentioned, and the rest of the team is directly involved in coaching. Uh, and those typically in the early stages, they take a full hour. So it's with the co-founder team. Um, and it's and then the entrepreneurs and residents begin mentoring as well directly. So it's intensive and a lot of advice from people who've been there, done it, started companies, multiple companies in most cases, um, multiple successes, some failures. And so a lot of lessons learned from the failures for sure. Um, it's unlimited mentor meetings. That's really determined only by the co-founders. And we always have an open door. We work on Slack. We work on our cell phones. We work in email, of course. Um, and it is there's a lot of communication. I guess that's kind of the bottom line. Here's a case study. Uh, one of the companies you may have heard of these folks, just a remarkable group, um, uh, the Volt Post. They, uh, they were in our first cohort. They transform lampposts. So think city lampposts, uh, think Brooklyn, but they're way beyond uh, the boroughs, uh, into smart electric vehicle charging stations managed by a mobile application that accelerates electric vehicle adoption. And they focus on, of course, decarbonization by providing cities scalable curbside charging for drivers. And you can think about the challenges that Volpost is up against in terms of making sure there's enough electricity at a given lamppost. And they work through all of that, they, you know, all the technical challenges and the business challenges associated. So from an investment standpoint, a little over $1.3 million uh, in the pre-seed round. Um, the Village Capital Accelerator, because a number of our folks who come through our program participate in other accelerators, and we are all in favor of that. Whatever helps, move the needle. Um, pending business development, awarded $65,000 from the state of Michigan to deploy lamppost charging in Detroit. Uh, $2.6 million seed around lead issuing term sheet. 
with an expected close of around five million, actually kind of happened in, in it's in process. Um, and they hired uh, to a total staff of 10 from the original three. So a wonderful case study. And uh, with, wish uh, Jeff and the team there uh, continued success. Mars Materials, Aaron um, is a pretty remarkable human being. He's done remarkable work for us. Uh, saw, met him first at National Renewable Energy Labs last year. Mars Materials, uh, they uh, do have uh, further funding from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, which we'll mention, uh, we don't really mention that down below, but that's true. Commercializing technology that converts uh, carbon dioxide and biomass. So think industrial biomass or wheat straw into low cost and low carbon feedstocks used for thermoplastics and synthetic fibers, such as 3D printing filaments and carbon fibers. So think auto panels. I mean, all sorts of products can be made uh, from the process that Mars Materials is developing. Uh, so had $660,000 in investment early on, along with uh, 4.3 in non-dilutive funding. So that's that's pretty extraordinary. You don't hear that a lot. Um, in October of 22, uh, Aaron Fitzgerald, CEO and co-founder, uh, Christian Gupsch, uh, a VP of Feedstock Development and co-founder, were announced to be accepted in the upcoming Breakthrough Energy uh, Fellowship. Uh, estimates they estimate that the technology can reduce carbon fiber production costs by roughly 50% with a mission to, uh, to store a one gigaton of carbon dioxide into everyday products. Olacoon Minerals. Uh, they extract valuable met metals and minerals from salty, mineral-rich wastewater streams, and they create products that can be used in concrete to build infrastructure, fertilizers for agriculture, batteries for electronics, and vehicles. They raised $1.1 in their seed round and an additional almost a million dollars additionally from prizes, grants, and other accelerators. They're currently part of Breakthrough Energy Fellows as well and the Westgate Fellowship at the National Renewable Energy Labs, which are based in Boulder, and the Elemental Accelerator. So again, um, a lot of acceleration and help because the the network of folks who are out there, like Breakthrough and others, um, and NREL, um, even the DOE, are in terms of willingness and assets and resources to help early stage companies, in particular in climate tech, is remarkable. And when you get exposed to that, you get introduced to that, it can really make an enormous difference in your success. So the focus there is on, from an impact standpoint, we focus a lot on greenhouse gas mitigation, reduction. Um, they recover lithium and battery metals from brine and waste streams to solve two problems at once, access to clean, provide access to clean drinking water and strengthen supply chains for the energy transition. Cohort four, I mentioned earlier, it's open now and closing soon. It closes officially, um, uh, really tomorrow. Um, we're going to be going through uh, interviews and boot camp selection. We've actually started the interviews. We started kind of early stage interviews for people who applied early to the program. That doesn't give them any leg up other than it helps with their workload. So we're already in the midst of our interviews for cohort four. The boot camp itself will have 40 companies enter the boot camp out of all the companies that have applied. I like to think the top 40. We're doing our best to get to the top 40. And that'll be from April 15th through April 18th. Uh, we'll have that'll be pretty interesting curriculum session. People who participate in the boot camp get a lot out of it. Uh, we make a lot of introductions, um, focus on uh, non dilutive grants and uh, IP. There's quite a bit of focus in terms of product and really how to launch a startup. Uh, and of course, you get to know the other folks in the cohort. Um, and out of boot camp, uh, we'll actually have the top 20 companies out of boot camp selected for the full program. So we'll be making announcements on that um, early May. And the program actually starts that we talked about. The, I talked about the weekly kind of curriculum a few minutes ago on May 20th. Boot camp, one week intensive boot camp that's aimed at introducing teams to a number of fundamental building blocks of, in the startup curriculum, building the right team. Uh, in my opinion, by far the most essential thing to do. Um, I've been on great teams and I've been on teams that didn't function well uh, in the startup universe. Uh, the great teams uh, raised billions of dollars. The teams that didn't, didn't function as well um, failed. 
So uh, building the right team and having the right people on the bus at the right time in their careers is essential. How to build pitch decks, that really come, there's a lot to it. How to build a pitch deck, sure, anybody can build a, a PowerPoint deck. Um, having actually the substance behind it and all the things that go into it, all the data, all the hard work, that's really the essential part. Um, setting up a data room, what is a data room? How to build it, um, that's really, that happens over the course of the program, but we introduce it during the boot camp. So by the end of the program, or really when we collectively, the co-founders and our team and the advisors, inclusive of the mentors and the uh, entrepreneurs and residents, agree that a company is ready for investment, um, that's when the data room must be ready. And getting going out and trying to raise money before you're ready is deadly. It does not work, uh, creates a lot of... Uh, ill will out in the marketplace. Getting ready, um, it, there are absolute markers that show you when you're ready for investment, absolute markers. And um, we can help you with that, of course, because that's what we do. Bootcamp will provide value, tremendous value to startups. We think we hear, we do surveys on that as well. Uh, connect candidates to our community broadly and our networks and allow us to assess coachability and fit. Coachability, if we can't coach someone and help them, get to the next level, what value is the program? So coachability, the fit of the program, we've had a number of companies, a few companies come through from an application process that are, they've already raised three, $4 million. They're pretty far along. They have their prototypes ready. They know their market. They've got an investment community. That's, that's beyond really our ability to really assist. We can introduce them to a scale program that's run by Second Muse, which is TRL7 or technology readiness level seven and beyond. We're before that stage. So we're really early stage, um, but that's part of the fit as well. It's coachability and fit readiness for our program. Your ability to benefit from this program is key for us. So applicants must have a technology that has the potential for substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We talked to a number that don't. The vast majority of people who apply to this program do, or they've got a pathway uh, and they may not have worked out their specific greenhouse gas uh, a bit, you know, numbers, the math associated with how much of a reduction they expect. And we can help with that. But they have to have kind of an idea of how they're going to go about doing that and what the implications of their technology are going to be. We do need a team that's coachable, driven, self-aware, um, open and honest or obvious things, uh, high integrity. Those are givens in my opinion and i think the opinion of my team um from a market and impact standpoint you know we're funded by nicerta again so new york state energy research development authority so it has to have impact now the good news is when you look at it through a nicerta lens um any great technology in the climate space that mitigates greenhouse gases and can uh, have a climate impact will impact new york state New York State has an enormous economy. It's got enormous issues around uh, climate tech, as does everywhere. And so if you've got a technology that's wonderful from a greenhouse gas mitigation standpoint, um, a climate impact standpoint, it's going to impact New York State. Um, so you have to at least have a focus in New York State. I mentioned it earlier. So the ability to get to New York State from the standpoint of eventually, at least, some manufacturing, some sales presence, potentially a headquarters move, but we're doing business with customers in New York State. All of that matters. It obviously doesn't have to be now. It can be longer term. Keys to a strong application. You need to be uh, specific when you're outlining the impact of your technology and the problem that you're solving. Give examples. If you've got um, I mentioned competitors, we mentioned competitors in the third bullet here. If you've got competitors and can show that there's a real market already uh, for your technology or a similar market, if you've got something truly ex extraordinarily innovative, we are working with one company right now that's making really bold claims, um, but you have to be able to show that there's a market for the product. Hone in on how this could be applied in New York State. So how might it impact New York State specifically? Will it serve, Will it focus on underserved communities? Those four pillars, the big T that I mentioned, the built environment, industry, the grid, or transportation. If you have competitors, again, share them. Competition can help validate the market. And be yourself. You know, we're uh, 
easy to talk to. <laughs> we're, we're experienced entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs typically are pretty uh, straightforward people. <laughs> That's been my experience. Uh, super hardworking, almost uh, relentless with their perseverance. So what our founders have said who've come through the program, uh, and it's interesting because these folks typically also become friends of ours. As time goes on, you get to know people really well when you're meeting with them several hours a week, every week. Nate Poon, um, the CEO of Able Aerospace, uh, based down in the um, New Labs in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, he'd recommend Venture for Climate Tech for the one-on-one -on -one mentorship that you get. So that was his focus. I won't read his entire quote. You can read it on your own. But it, he felt it was instrumental in helping him make the introductions that allowed him to launch pilots and get the ball rolling. Uh, Karen Barrett, who is um, a CEO at Amobia, uh, technology out of Stanford. She's brilliant. Uh, not born in the U.S. She's um, from Sweden originally. Um, and uh, she was named one of Forbes uh, 30 under 30 in the tech space and the, the climate space specifically. So uh, when she joined the program, they didn't have funding and she emerged with rather substantial funding in excess of $4 million. And she did it through hard work, excellent program, excellent technology, excellent development around that technology and tremendous work in terms of creating her own investment network with our help. Um, she feels it's we've been really helpful in coming up with solutions, suggestions, and coaching through some of the most critical challenges of the company every week. Um, Brian Tolliver, CEO of Banyan Power. Um, Brian uh, has a re pretty remarkable solution in the EV space. He feels uh, that Venture for Climate Tech has catapulted his company to the next level. Well-planned weekly curriculum covered all the bases, and he also thought the non-dilutive funding had an immediate impact for him. And these folks are all still working hard, working in business, and uh, I believe they're all going to be very successful. You can scan this below to apply now on F6S or uh, copy that uh, URL. And please go ahead and apply. You don't have a lot of time. Uh, if you do uh, are struggling at all with getting an application finished, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we can help you along. It's... Um, it's not that daunting. You could get it done this weekend. You truly could. Um, it depends on how much homework you've done in uh, in the past, but it's really not that daunting. It's a series of questions that talk about everything I just kind of went into. Uh, if you've got qu further questions, we're going to keep going, but put them in the Q&A now for us, please. Um, and my team is actually going to come on in just a moment and begin to talk about specifically that. Um, I know I can see we've got at least one. I'm going to ask uh, Scott Myers and Devin Sandin to jump in now and uh, kind of begin to answer the questions, and we'll kind of take turns answering them a bit. Devin or Scott, if you want to go ahead and just say hello. You've been introduced by me, but if you want to just introduce yourselves, that's great, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining today, Jack. Um, pleasure to, to hear you discuss this, as always, um, and thanks, everyone, so much for joining. I'm happy to kind of dive in and answer any more questions. We've we've tried our best to answer them as they've come in in the background here, but please, um, that was a great time to ask. Deb, I see you typing that one out, but can you go ahead and um, maybe uh, reiterate that question and then answer it out loud so other people can hear that? One? Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so we had a question about recommendations, recommenders. Uh, there's a function throughout Success where you can have a request for someone to be a recommender. What that means is that they'll get a request saying, hey, come on, make a, a profile on the platform and tell us why you're recommending this person, how you know them, why you think they're going to be a great fit for the program or are an excellent founder. I know some people have been having problems with that function and some people are having trouble setting up the profiles for their recommenders. If you're running into those issues, you can just email it to me and I uh, put my email in the chat, but it's just devin.sandin at nextcore.org. We've had some uh, great uh, question. Here's another one. Um, why is the problem that you're addressing the one that is particularly hard to de-risk? Can you explain the question? I'll let Devin take that. And then I've got, I've got a group of additional questions that have come in. Yeah, sure. So one way to think about our program is we are trying to help companies that are solving challenging problems that are going to be high impact. 
if a problem is easy to solve and there are 100 people all trying to solve it who will probably succeed, then there might not really be a big impactful innovation there. So we're really looking for why is this problem one that is still a problem? Why have other people not been able to solve it and what makes your solution special? And kind of at the top of the application pile, and not all the companies that come into our program have been reached this bar, but one of the bars that the folks at Breakthrough Energy Ventures use is, is rather high. I know because my last company actually hit the bar or we were capable of hitting the bars, maybe a better way to describe it. That is, can your technology, when it's fully deployed, let's say roughly by 2050, potentially have an impact on reducing greenhouse gases globally by 1%, so half a gigaton. It's a big number. Uh, and that's if it's adopted, your technology is widely adopted, you're successful, all of those things have to happen. That is the bar that they use at Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, that is, I guess, I think the highest bar of bars I've heard from the VC community and the funding community, but it is one that uh, is talked about a lot. So we, if you can't get there, it doesn't mean you can't get into our program um, because that would be too high a bar for us. Uh, to set. But that's kind of the beginning discussion we have. If you can only get, you know, one tenth of the way there or by the time you hit 2050 with a lot of success, that's still appealing to us. Yeah. One question I wanted to pull up that was answered um, uh, when the um, presentation was going on was a pretty simple one. It's uh, we received an email blast that the application deadline is now March 4th. Um, is this now the official application deadline date? That is, that wasn't reflected in this in the slide deck that Jack was presenting, but we did extend um, just due to the um, the high volume of quality applications we wanted to extend it to give a little more wiggle room. So that is extended to 8 p.m. on March 4th, Eastern. So 8 p.m. Eastern timing on March 4th is when the application will officially close. Gives you a little extra breathing room there to, to get it across the finish line. So you've got the weekend and uh, yeah. March 4th is Monday. Uh, so uh till 8 p.m. Eastern on, on Monday. Um, and again, if you're having trouble, just let us know and we'll see if we can assist. Uh, we had a company about a question about how many companies will be shortlisted for the cohort. It'll be 20 companies that come through the cohort, but 40 into the boot camp. Mm -hmm. So there are two short lists, I guess. There's the first 40 um, into the boot camp, and then from the boot camp, um, arguably the top 20. Um, I, I would argue that we do a pretty good job of selecting the top 20. Uh, one question was, how are we different from Clean Fight New York? Dad, are you aware of that? How are we yeah, different from that Fight one. Um, So I guess there's kind of two different steps there. So one, the Clean Fight is aimed at companies that are substantially further along. They want companies that already have a million dollars per year in revenue annually. And they have very specific sectors each year that they run. So last year was uh, Built Environment Tall Building Challenge. How do you deal with buildings that are, I think it was at least 40 floors or 40 stories tall? And then next year, I think that they're doing energy storage, although I'm not sure of that. Um, so we are earlier stage, much broader in who we take, and we sort of are the top of funnel for all the different NYSERDA programs, whereas the Clean Fight is one of the latter stage, probably the latest stage NYSERDA accelerator program. Cool. Uh, somebody asked, can you describe what a New York State uh, impact could look like for the program? Um, Devin, you want to try that or I'll, I'll jump in or Scott, anybody? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a number of ways that can go. Um, NYSERDA always cares about ratepayer right stuff. They want to have technologies that are going to reduce carbon emissions in New York State. So that can just mean that there is a market for it in New York State. That could mean that you want to do R&D with New York State, that you want to partner with people in New York State, want to manufacture here. There are any number of ways to have economic impacts or environmental impacts here. What it basically means is that if something doesn't have an impact in New York State, it could be, say, a material using tropical byproducts to solve tropical problems that is never going to touch at any point during its life New York State. That would have no impact. So you want to be on the opposite side of the spectrum from that. Jack, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, kind of going back to the whole New York State impact, anything that impacts climate, and in particular, because we're funded by NYSERDA, um, energy um, globally is going to have an impact in New York State. So um, that's that's realistic. When we think about the direct New York State impact, though, um, doing a little bit of homework, a little bit of research in terms of the industries in New York State that would benefit from your technology, potentially underserved communities that would benefit from your technology, those are kind of some of the keys to take a look at. Uh, we had a question from Gavin um, that he was invited. Uh, he's got a, New York, a NYSERDA focus. 
and he's kind of late to the application process. So will the presentation chat and contact information be available after this presentation to assist late applicants? Scott, you want to answer that one? Yeah, uh, of course it is. Um, uh, with the help with Chris, uh, we'll be sending out this recording and slide deck um, to everyone who registered for the event. Um, uh, would definitely, you know, get the ball rolling on that application process. Um, if you have email questions, things of that, um, get them in before the weekend starts. Um, it'll be a lot harder for us to communicate throughout the weekend. Um, and if not, um, you know, first thing Monday, reach out to us. But the applications will be closing on the 4th there at 8 p.m. So keep that in mind. But yeah, this information will be sent around. And then we're, um, we'll are we drop our um, emails in the chat so you can reach out to us with any specific questions. Um, so folks want to know so if if they can participate in another accelerator while they're in the program. We've had some folks do it. It's challenging because of the time commitment. If, uh, for example, Techstars or Greentown Labs or Y Combinator, all great programs for sure. Um, it's very challenging to actually uh, participate in two accelerators at the same time, especially one that requires virtual, like ours, virtual presence, and one that potentially requires an in-person presence like Techstars. Um, but doing them sequentially might make uh, a little bit more sense. Um, how many, how much funds fundraising prior to uh, applying is a, kind of an appropriate number? Uh, I'll let Devin take that one because it it's it's a little bit of a moving target. But Devin, what, what do you think? How much if they've raised four million dollars is that too much, or if they've raised two million dollars is that too much? Yeah. So the way I've described it in the past to people is that if someone has raised more than $2 million in institutional funding, they're probably past the program just because they've already hit these proof points to be investable in the first place. And they've already dealt with a lot of the challenges that our other founders are dealing with. So they're not going to benefit as much from the curriculum and peer-to-peer -peer learning. On the other Don't hand, if someone... Go sorry. ahead, Dan. Um The second part is if someone's over a million dollars, I think it still is potentially viable, but we need to dig a little deeper into program fit to make sure it's well aligned. The one exception to all of this, I would say, is companies that are a little further along but are trying to break into the U.S. market from other areas of the world. I think there's a bigger opportunity for us to help in ways that we wouldn't for domestic companies because they don't have access to many of the networks we have access to. And one last caveat there, and that is if all the funding or the vast majority has been non-dilutive and you haven't had dilutive funding, um, then and you need help in terms of getting out there and having you know, finding VCs and creating an investor program, that's something we can help with. So even if it were more than 2 million, but it was non-dilutive, that's intriguing. Um, so do you, do you have to have patents in place before you actually apply to the program? The answer is no. Patents are great. And we love it when companies do apply and they've got patents that are filed or even provisionals that are out there, but you do not have to have patents in place or even filed before you apply to the program. Um, are we looking for software or hardware companies? Yes, you're looking for software and hardware companies um, kind of across the broad space that we've talked about uh, a few times. Um, let's see, um, that's the majority. Um, do we have any, oh, it looks like we've got some additional ones here coming in. So it's, yeah, they're, they're pointing out specific questions. Dev, just because you have more of a beat in memory of the specific yeah. questions in their relation, could you maybe address this? Yeah, of course. So question 10 speaks more to problem solution fit. Like, is this a real acute problem that your customers need versus is this something that's nice to have for them? Uh, question 12 speaks to, okay, if this gets into the market, if it gets deployed, how does the world change as a result of that? What is the climate impact of that deployment? And so that requires some assumptions typically to answer that question, which when you're actually doing greenhouse gas calculations, you have to make assumptions. Let's say, for argument's sake, let's say you're making a material that goes into sneakers um, and it has the ability to actually sequester carbon. Well, well, two things. One is let's say it's actually got the ability, you're using recycled plastics, which is interesting. Um, and you've got the ability to sequester some carbon because you've got some chemistry going on. Um, how many sneakers will you sell? <laughs> what markets are you going to be in? Can it go into other products? If so, what other products might those be? How, you know, what will the potential impact be if your technology gets widely adopted globally and you're not, maybe not the next Nike, but you're a, a successful sneaker slash clothing slash carpet company beyond that if you go into other products with your chemistry. And that's what we're kind of done was heading with that. 
I think we've got the vast majority of the questions. Um, no, we've got still got some more coming in. This is great. Um, if there's weighting applied uh, with more team members versus a sole entrepreneur, no. Um, however, uh, the strength of the sole entrepreneur is going to have to be pretty formidable. Uh, um, it, it always comes back to the strength of the application. How strong does the technology look? If, you know, if someone working in a garage who has no technical experience and has come up with a, a brand new hardware solution or even a software solution, um, it would have to be a pretty compelling argument. Now, if they're working in a garage and, you know, they left Raytheon or, or Lockheed and they've got a tremendous technical background um, or they're the next, you know, uh, Wozniak or Jobs um, and they've got they've got the background to be able to do it in climate tech. That's great. So a sole proprietor is fine. Uh, absolutely. We have a number of sole proprietors that are, are already really strong applications in this cohort, because as I mentioned earlier, we've actually gone through some early application reviews so far. And they then they go into a technical review with some technical experts who are typically quite strong in their discipline to actually assess whether or not they think the technology is actually going to work uh, as it's been um, built. Yeah, and uh, Ooh, kind of, if you, go ahead, you don't mind, Jack, just adding on to that and kind of a through line to a past question as well. Um, you know, we're we're obviously to Jack's point, open to um, to accepting solo founders and things of that sort. Um, if it's a situation where you're in another accelerator or you can't commit full time, it's also a bandwidth issue there as well that we we touch base with through the interview processes and things of that sort. And um, if you're already participating in another accelerator and you're a solo founder and you can't divide and conquer there, um, that's going to be a big issue as well. Um, yeah. And then I can I can actually jump. And there was another question. Well, all sessions sure. held online. Um, but I like to say 98% of the program is virtual. So they all will be held online. Um, usually we do early on kind of ask for everyone's availability and things of that sort. But it usually lands at 10 a.m. Eastern, Tuesdays and Thursdays for our regular curriculum sessions. Um, and 10 a.m. seems to be a good time um, usually for encompassing the different time zones. But yeah, all... All the programming will be done virtual, except the in-person uh, showcase um, during uh, New York City Climate Week down in New York City. That's perfect, Scott. And so the um, now we are flexible. You know, we do have some companies applying from Cameroon and from all over the world. So we work it out. Uh, you know, Jenny Leung and Daniel Cruzier are based on the West Coast in the U.S. So the three hours different difference from us. So that can help in terms of schedule. And we're pretty flexible in terms of uh, time of day if we need to be. Um, let's see what else. Um, I think that pretty much does it. Um, one last thing about that, uh, kind of elaborate just a little bit on uh, Scott's point of 98% of it's done, uh, virtual and uh, online is exactly accurate. It's that climate week. We tip it, we do cover travel. And I mentioned that uh, in the slide deck, but you may have missed it. So we actually encourage our co-founders who've gone through the program to meet with us in New York City during climate week, typically third, but it is the third week of September. Um, and you'll be participating in climate week events, but also the showcase for us with Second Muse uh, and the investor. We're, we're kind of calling it an investor round robin. You kind of think, um, we'll leave it at that round robin. So investor meeting after investor meeting after investor meeting, where you can actually sit down and speak with investors, but there's also an on-stage showcase, three-minute presentation that'll be your typical investor presentation and incorporates your elevator pitch and, and beyond that. Um, Jose asked, does the company uh, need to already be incorporated? The answer is no, it does not. Um, but, uh, you know, in the process of kind of developing, the business plan has to be at least a, a bit thought out and uh, the, the technology in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so, so idea stage is good. Yeah, also to that point, and Deb, I don't know if you'll need to expand on this at all. Um, to, the not being incorporated or things of that sort is not barring in entry into the program, but it does, and correct me if I'm wrong, Devin, um, impact the ability of receiving the grant checks if there's not an incorporated. Uh, yeah, company, so right? we need to cut the grant checks to a company. So we usually just hold them until the company does incorporate and then send them. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But it's a, to apply to the program, no, you do not need to be incorporated to it in order to apply. Cool. 
I think we're doing pretty well. If you've got additional questions uh, and then ultimately you will have contact information, you will have the slide deck, you will have obviously the application. Uh, please don't hesitate. You know, we're here for you. We really are. That's our gig. <laughs> so um, we, uh, we're all in this because we're passionate about climate tech and we're passionate about helping early stage companies get to the next level and succeed. That is, that is what we do. Um, and so with that, I think uh, Chris will probably close things out. It's been uh, great having a chance to actually introduce the program and introduce uh, part of my team. Uh, and so good luck. We, uh, we hope that you, uh, you apply. If you haven't applied yet, reach out to us. If you've already applied or still have some questions, still don't hesitate to reach out. Um, one last bit on that. As we go through the close on Monday at 8 p.m. of the application process, um, you'll be hearing from us um, if, in fact, you're going into an interview cycle with us. Um, but ultimately, we won't be making announcements um, really for uh, quite some time. End of March is when you'll start to hear about whether or not you're going to be participating in the boot camp. So I don't want to have people thinking you're, you're going to hear something next Friday because you won't uh, typically unless we're uh, lining up interview meetings with you. So just try, try to set expectations there a little bit. But um, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today. Appreciate it. And thanks for joining from around the world. It's been a pleasure saying hello. And uh, we're looking forward to meeting you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.